Hey everyone, Beardo here, and welcome to another Minutia Minute. As usual, it's Wednesday comic book time. I've got a big stack, <laughs> so I'm going to get through these as quickly as I can. Um, I haven't ordered them from least favorite to most favorite. This time, I have ordered them from least favorite cover to most favorite cover, because there were a lot of really awesome covers this week. So, um, kind of changing it up, hope you enjoy. Uh, least favorite cover of the week, unfortunately, goes to Dawn of the Jedi Force Storm. Now, there's not much to say about the cover, so that's why it's my least favorite. Um, however, this issue is pretty good. Now, this is one that started off kind of on the bottom of my stack every week and has slowly been climbing. Now, we're at the climax with uh, issue five of the Force Storm story arc, and um, we do get, last week I kind of said I hope we were going to kind of get more of a team up between the Sith and the Jedi, and we do actually get that with this issue. So it's kind of fun because, you know, obviously the Jedi and the Sith are always mortal enemies, but here, this is the first time they've ever encountered each other, and so you get so kind of a lot of interesting sort of elements where um, this guy's the Sith here on the cover and, you know, the Jedi will be doing good things for each other and he's just kind of like, well, on my planet we would have eaten this person or, you know, <laughs> you know, like all kinds of crazy stuff like that. And so there's sort of, is this interesting sort of, um, you know, intermingling of different lifestyles in this book um, that makes it very interesting. And um, the teenage characters, the teenage Jedi and the teenage Sith, kind of start getting along almost. And of course at the end of the issue the adults come in and separate everything and you know they're very concerned with the fact that they have made friends with the Sith. But nevertheless they do have sort of a bond growing, and I think that's really interesting, a really good way to take this story. Um, obviously, everything Star Wars is always about Jedi versus Sith, so having something that kind of puts a spin on that is good. So, um, I was going to give this the first story arc and um, see if I was liking it better, because I didn't really like it when I first started, but I stuck with it, and I'm definitely leaning towards keeping it. Now, at the end of the month, I am going to do a big culling. We're going to go through all the books I got this month, and I'm going to pare it down, because I'm getting a few more books than I should be, so um, I'm not going to guarantee I'm going to keep this one, but uh, at the end of the month, this one is definitely more on the keep block more than on the chopping block, so really enjoyed this issue. Second least favorite cover of the week. Uh, I like this one a little bit better because the colors were prettier, but um, it's actually a pretty weak cover. Star Wars... Uh, Darth Vader in the Ghost Prison, issue number two. Now, this issue was fantastic. Um, I was, the first issue was sort of a sleeper hit for me. Uh, I just picked it up just kind of on a whim because I felt like getting something different and and I think it was a week where like I only had DC books uh, because all of my independent books and my Marvel books all come out this week. So like every other week I've got a ton of DC um, but then this week I've got tons of everything. And so I was looking for something different, and somehow this fell on this week, where I get all of my other non-DC titles. So, anyway. Long story short, though, this was the sleeper hit last month when it came out, and this month it continues to be excellent. Um, so we have the meeting of Darth Vader and our main character. Can't remember his name, sorry. Um, and our main character who has sort of like a two-face kind of element sort of physically and mentally because he's torn between his rebel friends and the empire chooses his side and um i guess I, i'm gonna spoil it he goes with the empire and so he's very he sort of becomes darth vader's sidekick and darth vader kind of takes him under his wing um but not in a let's be evil together kind of a way but in a like darth vader genuinely sees someone who has similar values to him and wants to help perpetuate that. So Darth Vader has other minions who are like, well, I don't trust this guy. But Darth Vader, you know, sticks up for him throughout the issue. So it was a really solid issue. Again, it's another one where instead of just being Jedi versus Sith or Rebel versus Empire, it's about the gray area. It's about, you know, people in extraordinary circumstances working together in ways that are more interesting than just good versus evil. So this book is really, really good. I'm really enjoying this. Uh, we get an appearance from the Emperor, which was pretty interesting, and um, we are building up towards the Ghost Prison incident, um, which is getting sort of teased at the end of the issue, 
when they make a return to the Jedi Temple and we see Darth Vader uh, watching a hologram recording of Anakin Skywalker facing the Jedi Council uh, in that room. It's sort of re-recorded and then broadcast in the actual room that took place in, which was really creepy and very got me very excited for the next issue. So anyway, this is definitely a pickup. If you're sort of a mild Star Wars fan, obviously if you're not a fan at all, you're probably not going to like this, but if you like comics and you enjoy Star Wars, um, but you don't usually get the comics. This one I really do recommend. It's only a limited series. I think it's five issues, but it doesn't say on the cover. Uh, so check it out. It's really worth worth a pickup. All right. Now we are around the middle point of great covers. Uh, this one was a good cover, but um, compared with some of the other covers, it's whatever. <laughs> and it's Daredevil issue number 14. I gotta start looking at this number before I pick them up. Anyway, um, this, however, was very, very close, if not my pick of the week. Um, I don't have a pick of the week this week, but this is definitely a contender. There were a couple contenders. This is definitely one of them. Um, we have got Daredevil, and he is in Latveria, as we saw at the end of the last issue. We do not see Doctor Doom, as we see on the cover. We see his banker. And his banker is basically, he's pissed about this whole Omega Drive thing because he was going to use it to um, basically run Mega Crime's um, like monetary needs. And then he was, through fees and interest and all that stuff, he was going to make a fortune for Latveria. And Matt Murdock threw a wrench in all that when he stole the Omega Drive. So he's guilty of of bank terrorism in Latveria, and that's why he's been taken to Latveria. So, Daredevil um, is punished, and I. this is another one that's like, I don't know how much to spoil, because it's such a big part of the issue, um, but at the same time, it would kind of take away the fun, so um, I'm going to err on the spoiler side, so if you ever end this, you've read this yet, you might want to skip it, but basically... Um, they pump gas into that little glass room that he's in at the beginning or the end of the last issue and he doesn't really notice anything he just you know tries not to breathe the gas but after 10 minutes of holding his breath he can't hold his breath any longer and then they let him go and they're like get out of here and Daredevil manages to mess it up because instead of just leaving he attacks the guards and so he's basically punishable with death on sight, and so he's trying to get out of Latveria. The whole issue is him trying to get out, and he doesn't know what this gas has done to him. And as we get further into the issue, we find out exactly what it's done to him. And the end of the issue, um, it's taken its toll, and Matt Murdock doesn't know if he's escaped Latveria or not because of what happened to the chemical, or what happened with the, the gas that was put in his brain. And so, he thinks he's in one place, and he may or may not be in that place. So, I don't know if I spoiled it or not. Like I said, you should have skipped ahead if you haven't read this yet. Great, great issue as always. Best issue I've read in a, in a little while, just because this Omega Drive thing's been, it's been fun, but it hasn't been like crazy good. Um, but this really was excellent. So, go pick this up if you're not picking it up already. Daredevil always should be a pickup. Alright. Next up, middle of the road covers. Um, all these covers are good. Uh, my top three are excellent. So these are like the solid covers, starting with that Daredevil one. Next up, another solid cover as always is Wonder Woman. Um, number 10 and... This is a little bit weaker of an issue for Wonder Woman, which isn't to say that it's bad at all, because it was actually a very, very good issue. Um, we do have a filler artist with the filler artist, <laughs> so normally we have Cliff Chang, the, sort of the B artist is Tony Akins. Um, Tony Akins is on the run right now, but he wasn't able to finish this issue, so we get about eight or nine pages from Kano. Um, they do a good job of blending it in. If I hadn't looked, when I, you know, I always read the credits at the beginning. If I hadn't looked at the credits, I think I would have noticed, but, you know, it, I wouldn't have been looking for it, I guess. So, um, it was still solid art. The story gets a little, like... It's all about love, and <laughs> so that part was a little silly. However, the ending was very, very good. 
Um, honestly, I don't have a whole lot to say about this book, which is kind of disappointing. I, I think that's why it's um, why it's not quite as good as some of the other issues, because usually I've just got a million things to say about Wonder Woman. This issue, um, we're getting some resolution um, from what's come before. Uh, obviously, at the end of the last issue, uh, Wonder Woman is sort of both at her wedding and at her trial, and she is going to have to put on the lasso of truth and say whether or not she marries, or whether or not she truly loves Hades. And she does go through that, and she does give an answer. It was a very interesting answer, um, but as they played up the answer and continued to sort of, once the answer was given, it was kind of like a whoa moment. And, um, because of the way they approached it. And then the way they deal with it later just kind of got a little, like, eye rolly for me. I don't know if anyone else felt that way, but it was just a little cheesy. Uh, it's another one of those, like I, like I said before, it's like, love is in the air. You know what I mean? It's just like, come your break. Anyway, but it did have a really good ending, and it was still a very good issue. Excited for issue 11, as always. All right. Now, another contender for Pick of the Week this week, always a contender, if not the Pick of the Week, very regularly, is, of course, Saga. Issue number four. Now, this one um, definitely centers on the will more, and this is a very, very graphic issue, <laughs> indeed. Um, so, he goes to a pleasure planet, because he hasn't been having a great time. He ran into, you know, there was sort of the implication of, I can't remember her name, but, you know, the crazy, like, octo-insectoid hunter person. Um, there's clearly some kind of history between him and her, which got dredged up when she called him for help regarding um, Marco and family. And so that's clearly put him in sort of a bad mood, and so he goes to this pleasure planet to feel better. And we see lots and lots and lots of very graphic sex in this book. Um, more so than in issue one, but mostly in quantity, not so much in quantity, because um, two TVs having sex is about as weird as you're going to get, I think. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but anyway... The main characters, still uh, trying to get off planet, are in some ways kind of the B story in this book. Um, they are still dealing with the big revelation at the end of the last issue, which is Marcos has um, a potential other wife, or at least an ex, uh, an ex wife, or someone who was at least engaged to, or something. And so they're kind of dealing with the fallout of that. That sort of continues a little bit. But um, really the most interesting stuff for me was the stuff with the Will here on the cover. Um, the ending is really creepy. Um, you get basically nothing is satisfying him. He's walking around and he's seeing just these massive lesbian orgies and heterosexual orgies and domination. And whatever you can think of is in this book, as I said. And it's just not doing it for him. And so this really skeezy guy with a square head who is perfectly designed, as all the characters in this book are perfectly designed, says he's going to take him into a new place um, that will, you know, satiate his desires. And he goes into that deeper place, and um, they get down into this little room, sort of well-furnished room in the middle of somewhere, and he's like, are you presentable? And he's like, and the person responds like, you know, in, I'm anything but presentable or something like that, the the person says. And this guy with the square head and his huge teeth is like, I taught her to say that. And it's kind of like this kind of cheesy, funny moment. But then you turn the page and it's brutal. And I'm not going to tell you how the comic ends, but it's definitely very, very disturbing. So solid issue. This book always, like, I mean, this issue didn't really further the plot a lot. Um, you're getting more character development, but it doesn't matter what this book is about. It always, always, always just tears um, at your emotions. You know, there's always something in it that really gets you thinking and in some way, like, gets your brain moving. So, anyway, fantastic issue. Easily a contender um, for best... Um, Best issue of the week. Anyway, 
So the last three issues have phenomenal covers, which is why I decided to organize these by covers. Third best cover of the week goes to The Shadow, issue number three. And this week's issue was a little weak, actually. This wouldn't be this high on my list if I wasn't doing the covers. However, and this is um, the John Cassidy cover, and I just really dug the scarf making the S. That just is really looks quite nice, in my opinion. Um, issue inside... I'm not quite sure. I, I have to reread issue number two, um, maybe even issue number one, but basically everyone is on the hunt for magic rocks. And these magic rocks are going to create some kind of their energy uh, fuel for this super weapon. And basically the way the crooks in this have played it, they've got absolutely everyone on the hunt for these magic rocks. And so it's all everyone just kind of going after them. There's a lot of dialogue and a lot of setup. It doesn't really move very quickly. Um, I think that this is a story that might play out better in a graphic novel sense because in the first issue you have a lot of setup. In the second issue you have this big sort of action sequence uh, on a plane that kind of you know is sort of that second real action moment if you're thinking of it in a movie terms. And then issue three, we're kind of back to more setup-y stuff again. And it, from issue to issue, I, I feel like it doesn't quite play right. The second issue was a blast to read, but also, ultimately it was kind of a sidetrack. You know what I mean? It's like they don't really get anywhere in terms of the story, but you get this kind of good sort of action, uh, action sequence to kind of help the momentum of the story. And this one, we're furthering the story, but there's no action. And so it's just kind of a little teeter-tottery. Um, so for that reason, this is actually probably the weakest book that I read this week, um, but beautiful cover, let me say. <laughs> um, so I'm just not sure. I'm going to wait, read issue four. Um, this one I definitely am going to keep for the first story arc, but it may just be one that's better in um, a trade paperback kind of a way. So we'll see. All right, second best cover of the week goes to Batwoman. And, um... This issue was pretty good. I am warming up, as we're concluding this story arc, I'm warming up to it. There are a couple kind of cheesy moments in this book, I felt like, um, but I get it now. Like, stuff is coming to a head um, to a point where I'm remembering what happened from last issue. There's less confusion around, like, you know, just spending one page on every single time frame that this book is taking place in uh, is less frustrating for me because I am kind of picking it up now, which is good. Uh, however, that said, there's still moments where I feel like I didn't need this scene. Like, we don't need this point from, you know, 28 hours ago or whatever it was where we explain how Killer Croc became the way he is in this story arc. Like, I feel like that is wasted time. Um, I mean, it's nice to know, but I feel like you could have filled in those gaps elsewhere and cut out that entire sort of time sequence. You know what I mean? I don't feel like it really added anything to the story. And that's been my big problem with this story is for having all the time jumps and back and forth with different people and different characters and blah, blah, blah. Um, I think that... It's not just a matter of the fact that it was confusing, it's a matter of the fact that you just didn't need all those different storylines to tell this story. Um, so, take it for what it is. Um, second to last story in this arc, I'm excited to be on to the new story arc, but I am actually enjoying this one a lot more now. And, um, great cover. Awesome. Alright, however, cover of the week this week goes to none other than IDW's Mars Attacks. Now, it doesn't go to this cover specifically. It goes to the 58 color covers that this issue has. Yes, there are 58 different covers for this issue. They have them all listed in the back of the issue. It takes th three pages to go through them all. Um, now, I don't know if anyone is following this whole Mars Attacks thing, um, but basically, they're rebooting Mars Attacks, in IDW. This was actually a very entertaining issue to read. Um, not contender for Pick of the Week by any means, but it was a lot of fun. It's written by John Lehman of Chew, so if you like Chew, check it out. And to sort of commemorate this big event of Mars Attacks coming back, IDW pulled this 58 cover stunt. And basically what it is, is they take 
one card from the 1960s or 50s. I can't remember exactly when it came out. Um, but the 19, we'll say 1950s, Mars Attacks tops trading card set. And they make each card a cover. So that accounts for like 57 or 55 of them. And then there's also sort of like a story so far kind of card um, that is also a cover. There is the cover I got, which is a cover by the interior artist. This is actually a variant edition. And I got to tell you the reason I got the variant edition, I spent an extra dollar to get the variant edition, which I never do. Um, the reason why I did it for this issue is because I don't want to have an issue that has a number 25 or a 36 on it, because then I'm going to feel like I need to go get all 50 million other issue covers. <laughs> and if I do that, then I'm seriously in trouble. So I figured just spend one extra dollar, get the variant cover, so I can just look at the other covers in the back, and I'll still feel like my collection is complete. <laughs> but anyway, back to the point. So there's um, 55 or whatever card covers, and then there's this retailer incentive cover, and there's like a Comic-Con exclusive cover, and a couple others. But anyway, um, so you can actually get the whole Mars Attacks card trading set in issue cover form. And if you look in the back, open this up again here, they do have an ad where if you really want to have all 50 bazillion covers, um, there is an ad in the back somewhere. Can I find it? Can I find it in time. Um, Apparently I cannot. Oh, here it is. It's right on the back cover. Uh, you can actually get all 50 whatever covers in sort of like um, a trading card box. It's $199.95, by the way. <laughs> anyway, uh, it is what it is. But anyway, the issue itself was a lot of fun. Um, we're getting the story of... General Czar, I think his name is, who's the guy on the cover, and um, he had a bad experience in the 1960s. He crash landed on Earth, and he was um, sold by farmers to a traveling freak show, and he makes his escape and he vows vengeance. Now, I don't know if this is supposed to t like be a reboot of Mars Attacks or if it's a like a sequel of some kind. But basically, this story ends with the beginning of the invasion. Now, at the end of the Mars Attacks trading card set, um, Mars explodes. So, so, I don't know if Mars exists in this Mars Attacks universe, or if these, you know, if these are, like, Mar Martian remnants of their fleet, or if this is Mars attacking for the first time. So I'm excited for issue two to kind of figure that out. I'm sure if I looked online, I'd find out, but let's be surprised. <laughs> anyway, if you're not picking up Mars Attacks and you like this kind of stuff, I had a huge amount of fun reading it. It wasn't anything special, but it was just fun. So anyway, cover of the week goes to Mars Attacks from sheer volume of covers, and that was just a cool idea, I thought. Anyway, um, while I was out and about today, I was at Half Price Books, and I did get a very, 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 very small comic book haul. Just two issues. And um, let me show you what I got, because they were good ones. First of all, I'm going to show you Batman number 253. Uh, I picked this one up because, obviously, Shadow's going on right now. This is, I think, Irv Novak on art and Denny O'Neill telling a Shadow story, which um, can't go wrong with that, right? So, love the cover on this, really cool. However, the really crazy awesome one I got was Batman number 244. And both of these are probably, I'd say probably very good to find condition. They've got a lot of spine wear. Uh, I'm not sure if, it's not super excessive wear, so it might be fine. I, I'd say that's probably fine condition. But anyway, um, this is obviously a Rachel Ghoul story, written by Danny O'Neill, drawn by uh, Neil Adams. Awesome. So, uh, got a couple more Batman books working on completing my collection. Um, I am. Let me take a look here. I, I did when I reorganized my comics, as you can see behind me. Um, I wrote, sat down, and did a list of all the books that I'm working on collecting right now. It was three pages. And uh, the final page is the Bat List. These are all the Batman issues I'm missing. Uh, the ones that are boxed in here are the, um, are the Modern Age books that I'm missing. So I'm getting really close to completing 
uh, my modern age Batman collection. I'm missing 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 16 issues, which out of 300 isn't too bad. <laughs> so I'm hoping to actually wrap that up very soon. Because, um, I mean, a lot of them are very expensive. I just have to get around to finding them. Um, some of them have pretty low runs. Sort of those 90s ones, I think, had pretty low print runs. So they're not really expensive books when you find them. But if you go look for them online, they're kind of expensive. So I'm kind of avoiding that. But I am hoping to wrap up my Modern Age Batman collection by the end of the summer. Which means, at the end of the summer, at some point here, I'm going to have a massive... Um, Batman collection showing off event where I'm going to show off my entire modern age collection starting with Batman year one and working all the way up to the end of the first volume which is 713 or whatever so look forward to that if you like Batman I'm going to show you a whole bunch of Batman covers it'll be fun it'll be a little celebration there'll be cake if you bring it <laughs> um, anyway that's all I've got for this video I'm sure this is running really long because I have a whole bunch of comics for you hope you enjoyed what I got um, like up above or like below subscribe above leave comments below uh, that's all I got anyway talk to y'all later bye